Hi there. Welcome to my space of make believe. This is where I let the words take me anywhere, be anyone, do anything, and I would love to have you for company. This one here is a love story, well, kind of, published in the London Review on 2nd March 1861. It takes you to some beautiful moors in England, and according to the author Anthony Trollope, the most beautiful of all, and this is where the local girl falls in love with the visiting city boy. Is it a happy ending? Let's find out, shall we? The Parson's Daughter of Oxney Cone by Anthony Trollope, part one. The prettiest scenery in all England, and if I am contradicted in that assertion, I will say in all Europe, is in Devonshire, on the southern and southeastern skirts of Dartmoor, where the rivers Dart and Avon and Tain form themselves, and where the broken moor is half cultivated, and the wild-looking uplands fields are half moor. In making this assertion, I am often met with much doubt, but it is by persons who do not really know the locality. Men and women talk to me on the matter, who have travelled down the line of railway from Exeter to Plymouth, who have spent a fortnight at Torquay, and perhaps made an excursion from Tavistock to the convict prison on Dartmoor. But who knows the glories of Checkford? Who has walked through the parish of Manaton? Who is conversant with Lusley Cleves and Withycombe in the moor? Who has explored Hone Chase? Gentle reader, believe me that you will be rash in contradicting me unless you have done these things. There or thereabouts, I will not say by the waters of which little river it is washed, is the parish of Oxney Cone. And for those who would wish to see all the beauties of this lovely country, a sojourn in Oxney Cone would be most desirable, seeing that the sojourner would then be brought nearer to all that he would delight to visit than at any other spot in the country. But there is an objection to any such arrangement. There are only two decent houses in the whole parish and these are or were when I knew the locality small and fully occupied by their possessors. The larger and better is the parsonage in which lived the parson and his daughter and the smaller is the freehold residence of a certain Miss Lee Smiger who owned a farm of a hundred acres which was rented by one farmer Cloisey and who also possessed some 30 acres round her own house, which she managed herself, regarding herself to be quite as great in cream as Mr. Cloisey, and altogether superior to him in the article of cider. But yo has to pay no rent, miss, Farmer Cloisey would say, when Miss Lee Smiger expressed this opinion of her art in a manner too defiant. Yo pays no rent, or yo couldn't do it. Miss Lee Smiger was an old maid with a pedigree and blood of her own. A hundred and thirty acres of fee simple land on the borders of Dartmoor, fifty years of age, a constitution of iron, and an opinion of her own on every subject under the sun. And now, for the parson and his daughter. The parson's name was Woolsworthy or Woolworthy as it was pronounced by all those who lived around him. And Reverend Saul Woolsworthy and his daughter was Patience Woolsworthy or Miss Petty as she was known to the Devonshire world of those parts. That name of Patience had not been well chosen for her, for she was a hot-tempered damsel, warm in her convictions and inclined to express them freely. She had but two closely intimate friends in the world, and by both of them, this freedom of expression had been fully permitted to her since she was a child. Miss Lee Smiger and her father were well accustomed to her ways, and on the whole well satisfied with them. The former was equally free and equally warm-tempered as herself, and as Mr. Woolsworthy was allowed by his daughter to be quite paramount on his own subject, for he had a subject, he did not object to his daughter being paramount on all others. A pretty girl was Patience Woolsworthy at the time of which I am writing, and one who possessed much that was worthy of remark and admiration had she lived where beauty meets with admiration, 
or where force of character is remarked. But at Oxney Cold, on the borders of Dartmoor, there were few to appreciate her, and it seemed as though she herself had but little idea of carrying her talent further afield, so that it might not remain forever wrapped in a blanket. She was a pretty girl, tall and slender, with dark eyes and black hair. Her eyes were perhaps too round for regular beauty, and her hair was perhaps too crisp. Her mouth was large and expressive. Her nose was finely formed, though a critic in female form might have declared it to be somewhat broad. But her countenance altogether was very attractive, if only it might be seen without that resolution for dominion which occasionally marred it, though sometimes it even added to her attractions. It must be confessed on behalf of Patience Woolsworthy that the circumstances of her life had peremptorily called upon her to exercise dominion. She had lost her mother when she was 16 and had had neither brother nor sister. She had no neighbours near her fit either from education or rank to interfere in the conduct of her life, excepting always Miss Lee Smiger. Miss Lee Smiger would have done anything for her, including the whole management of her morals and of the parsonage household, had Patience been content with such an arrangement. But much as Patience had ever loved Miss Lee Smiger, she was not content with this, and therefore she had been called on to put forth a strong hand of her own. She had put forth this strong hand early, and hence had come the character which I am attempting to describe. But I must say on behalf of this girl, that it was not only over others that she thus exercised dominion. In acquiring that power, she had also acquired the much greater power of exercising rule over herself. But why should her father have been ignored in these family arrangements? Perhaps it may almost suffice to say that of all living men, her father was the man best conversant with the antiquities of the country in which he lived. He was the Jonathan Oldbuck of Devonshire, and especially of Dartmoor, but without that decision of character which enabled Oldbuck to keep his womankind in some kind of subjection, and probably enabled him also to see that his weekly bill did not pass their proper limits. Our Mr. Old Buck of Oxney Cone was sadly deficient in these respects. As a parish pastor, with but a small cure, he did his duty with sufficient energy to keep him, at any rate, from reproach. He was kind and charitable to the poor, punctual in his services, forbearing with the farmers around him, mild with his brother clergymen, and indifferent to aught that bishop or archdeacon might think or say of him. I do not name this latter attribute as a virtue, but as a fact. But all these points were as nothing in the known character of Mr. Woolsworthy of Oxney Cone. He was the antiquarian of Dartmoor. That was his line of life. It was in that capacity that he was known to the Devonshire world. It was as such that he journeyed about with his humble carpet bag, staying away from his parsonage a night or two at a time. It was in that character that he received now and again stray visitors in the single spare bedroom. Not friends asked to see him and his girl because of their friendship, but men who knew something as to this buried stone or that old landmark. In all these things, his daughter let him have his own way, assisting and encouraging him. That was his line of life, and therefore she respected it. But in all other matters, she chose to be paramount at the parsonage. Mr. Woolsworthy was a little man who always wore, except on Sundays, grey clothes, clothes of so light a grey that they would hardly have been regarded as clerical in a district less remote. He had now reached a goodly age, being full 70 years old, but still he was wiry and active, and showed but few symptoms of decay. His head was bald, and the few remaining locks that surrounded it were nearly white. But there was a look of energy about his mouth and a humour in his light grey eye, which forbade those who knew him to regard him altogether as an old man. As it was, he could walk from Oxney Cone to Priestown, fifteen long Devonshire miles across the moor, and he who could do that could hardly be regarded as too old for work. 
But our present story will have to do more with his daughter than with him. A pretty girl, I have said, was Patience Woolsworthy, and one too in many ways remarkable. She had taken her outlook into life, weighing the things which she had and those which she had not, in a manner very unusual and as a rule not always desirable for a young lady. The things which she had not were very many. She had not society. She had not a fortune. She had not any assurance of future means of livelihood. She had not high hope of procuring for herself a position in life by marriage. She had not that excitement and pleasure in life which she read of in such books as found their way down to Oxney Cohen Parsonage. It would be easy to add to the list of the things which she had not, and this list against herself she made out with the young utmost vigour. The things which she had, or those rather which she assured herself of having, were much more easily countered. She had the birth and education of a lady, the strength of a healthy woman, and a will of her own. Such was the list as she made up for herself, and I protest that I assert no more than the truth in saying that she never added to it either beauty, wit, or talent. I began these descriptions by saying that Oxney Cohn would, of all places, be the best spot from which a tourist could visit those parts of Devonshire, but for the fact that he could obtain there none of the accommodation which tourists require. A brother antiquarian might, perhaps, in those days have done so, seeing that there was, as I have said, a spare bedroom at the parsonage. Any intimate friend of Miss Lee Smyges might be as fortunate, for she was also so provided at Oxney Cone, by which name her house was known. But Miss Lee Smyges was not given to extensive hospitality, and it was only to those who were bound to her, either by ties of blood or of very old friendship, that she delighted to open her doors. As her old friends were very few in number, as those few lived at a distance, and as her nearest relations were higher in the world, World than she was, and was said by herself to look down upon her, the visits made to Oxney Cone were few and far between. But now, at the period of which I am writing, such a visit was about to be made. Miss Lee Smyger had a younger sister who had inherited a property in the parish of Oxney Cone, equal to that of the lady who had lived there. But this younger sister had inherited beauty also, and she therefore in early life had found sundry lovers, one of whom became her husband. She had married a man even then well-to-do in the world, but now rich and almost mighty, a member of parliament, a lord of this and that board, a man who had a house in Eaton Square and a park in the north of England, and in this way her course of life had been very much divided from that of our Miss Lee Smyger. But the lord of the government board had been blessed with various children, and perhaps it was now thought expedient to look after Aunt Penelope's Devonshire acres. Aunt Penelope was empowered to leave them to whom she pleased, and though it was thought in Eaton Square that she must, as a matter of course, leave them to one of the family, nevertheless a little cousinly intercourse might make the thing more certain. I will not say that this was the sole cause for such a visit, but in these days a visit was to be made by Captain Broughton to his aunt. Now, Captain John Broughton was the second son of Alfonso Broughton, of Clapham Park and Eaton Square, Member of Parliament and Lord of the aforesaid Government Board. And what do you mean to do with him? Patience Woolsworthy asked of Miss Lee Smyger when that lady walked over from the cone to say that her nephew John was to arrive on the following morning. Do with him? Why, I shall bring him over here to talk to your father. He'll be too fashionable for that, and Papa won't trouble his head about him if he finds that he doesn't care for Darthmore. Then he may fall in love with you, my dear. Well, yes, there's that resource at any rate, and for your sake, I dare say, I should be more civil to him than Papa. But he'll soon get tired of making love to me, and what you'll do then, I cannot imagine. That Miss Woolsworthy felt no interest in the coming of the captain, I will not pretend to say. The advent of any stranger with whom she would be called on to associate must be a matter of interest to her in that secluded place, and she was not so absolutely unlike other young ladies that the arrival of an unmarried young man would be the same to her as the advent of some patriarchal paterfamilias.
in taking that outlook into life of which I have spoken. She had never said to herself that she despised those things from which other girls received the excitement, the joys, and the disappointment of their lives. She had simply given herself to understand that very little of such things would come in her way, and that it behoved her to live, to live happily if such might be possible, without experiencing the need of them. She had heard, when there was no thought of any such visit to Oxney Cone, that John Broughton was a handsome, clever man, one who thought much of himself and was thought much of by others, that there had been some talk of his marrying a great heiress, which marriage, however, had not taken place through unwillingness on his part, and that he was on the whole a man of more mark in the world than the ordinary captains of ordinary regiments. Captain Broughton came to Oxney Cone stay there for the night the intended period for his projected visit having been fixed at three or four days and then went his way he went his way back to his London haunts the time of the year then being the close of the Easter holy days but as he did so he told his aunt that he should assuredly return to her in the autumn and assuredly I shall be happy to see you John if you come with a certain purpose, if you have no such purpose, you'd better remain away. I shall assuredly come, the captain had replied, and then he had gone on his journey. The end of part one. So, does he return? What happened between him and Patty that he wants to return? Well, join me in the second part and we shall find out together. Thank you so much for joining me today. I will look out for you in the next video. Till next time, go grab a book to read or a pen to write and let your imagination take you anywhere. Be anyone, do anything.